بسم الصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to this program. I don't know what kind of audience we have. Um, I was asked to speak about how Islam came to the Indian subcontinent. So that's a very vast topic. How are we going to speak about the very first Muslims that arrived on the shores of the subcontinent? Are we going to talk about the history of Muslims in the subcontinent from um, early days until now? Um, should we focus on scholarship? Should we focus on the famous Muslim scholars that hailed from that region? Should we focus on the many books that are treasures in our heritage that were written by people who lived in India or the sub greater subcontinent area? So inshallah, let's begin uh, with a brief introduction. India, first and foremost, um, when I say India, I want you to divorce yourself or divorce in your mind the country known as India today. Um, when we're talking about history, we're talking about this entire subcontinent. So when, we, when I say India, uh, I don't necessarily mean modern India. I mean that entire region which today would be Afghanistan, it would be Pakistan, it would be parts of Iran, it would be India, it would be Sri Lanka, it would encompass Bangladesh, it would encompass so many other countries. So we're talking about the region. So I'm talking about India as a region, so I don't want anyone to uh, misunderstand that or get offended, because the politics in that region is very, um, very intense. Um, so the Indian subcontinent is a strange and exotic place. It's a place that kind of is attached to the world and separate from the world at the same time. It's a place that uh, various empires came and they kind of ignored and they left. And some of them actually ventured into the subcontinent. It's a place that never really was um, united in a centralized civilization that united the entire subcontinent. It was always a decentralized place. Um, it was always divided. There are only three rulers in history that kind of governed over the entire subcontinent. The majority of empire, the majority of people that uh, were involved in India or the subcontinent, um, they governed parts of the region. It's a vast region. It's a vast region with hundreds of languages. Now imagine that hundreds of languages. People think there's one language, one type of food, one type of culture. It's something the Arabs used to call this region, Akkalatul Umam. It's a place that eats up nations. So it's like a it's like a exotic place that just eats up different cultures and nations. Um, so it's a melting pot. It's diverse. It's exotic. It's colorful, and everything that you imagine about India. A lot of people have this image. It's basically true, and but at the same time, it's very important for us because India was always part of the Muslim world from very early on. Muslims came into India in the time of the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet Wasallam. So it was always part in some way, shape, and form of the greater Muslim world. And it impacted the rest of the world in profound ways. For instance, when the Mongols came and ravaged the Muslim heartland in the 1200s, many of the, you know, it, they destroyed civilizations, they buried people alive, they uh, sacked Baghdad. So in this time, many of the people fled either to the west or to the east. To the west, they would go to North Africa or to uh, Andalus, for, perhaps. And in the east, they would go to India. So many Muslims, and including many scholars, came and settled in India in that time. And they produced great works. India had an advanced educational system. And it is said that no book was written in Baghdad until it was approved by scholars in India. In the city of Delhi, there was a madrasa on every single street. And the, the type of learning that was imparted there by the Muslims was so advanced. There was a European traveler, and even as late as the 18th century, he traveled through parts of India, and he said he found that the average Muslim that was educated in those regions, average Muslim, his level of education was on par with the ministers in Europe. So it was very, very advanced. Um, 
And I'll talk more about that towards the end. And it contributed to the Muslim world. And today, all around the world, you have you know, people that hail from that region in every single community in masjid. I'm from that region. Uh, I was born in Pakistan. My parents were born in India. Uh, every community uh, around the world, from Europe to Africa to Asia to, to America to Canada, how many masajids, how many communities um, are dominated by people or the majority of members or administration, perhaps even imams, hail from that region. So it's very, very important. And it's important for the rest of you, I'm trying to share with you why you need to study India. For the rest of us who don't come from that region, most of these communities, you have to understand the culture. The culture in many massages, as Sheikh Shanawi said, um, many of the things uh, uh, come from India and they color the landscape of the communities here. Many of you are used to eating biryani, for instance. Um, and that's, in, that's in a food that comes from that region. And it's a food that's very, um, very much enjoyed in so many massages by many different cultures around the world. Um, so, and there's so many organizations. Beyond that, there are organizations, there are intellectual trends, there are revivalist movements that were born in India. And now they affect Muslim communities all around the world. How many people have heard of Tablighi Jamaat? How many masajid, um, you know, uh, have members or people who work with this great movement that bring people to the masajid? Um, how many imams, they have degrees called the alim degree? And so many masajid, they have muftis and alims that are educated by the curricula that, that was born in India. Today there's a curriculum called dars e nizami that produces the imams that populate the majority of, of, of masajid and centers around the world. So all this has to do with India. Um, Indian Muslims contributed to Islamic scholarship. Some of, the great univers uh, some of the great dictionaries were compiled by Indians. One of my teachers, Sheikh Akram Nadwi, Hafizullah Ta'ana, he jokes with his Arab friends that, look, you're Arabic, but all your best dictionaries are written by Indians. One of the first to write an Arabic dictionary was Alama Saghani. And he was someone who settled in, 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 in India. So he wrote one of the first dictionaries. And after him, Fayruz Abadi, who was the most famous uh, person to write a dictionary, he took basically his, his dictionary as a template, and he produced his own. So it was started with an Indian, and then it was a Persian that kind of perfected it. And that's the most famous dictionary. And after that, there was a commentary written by Murtada Az-Zabidi, who also was from India. So there's so many great uh, contributions to Islamic scholarship by Indian Muslims. There was a great muhaddith of the past century, Abdul Hay Al-Katani, rahimahullah ta'ala. He used to, he was a great muhaddith. He wrote so many books. And his children and his family members today are great hadith scholars. So he used to say that for him to narrate hadith through the scholars of India, going back to a great scholar named Shah Waliullah, for him it was equivalent to Imam Nafir from Ibn Umar, from the Prophet Wasallam. This hadith, Isnad, from Imam Malik of Medina, from Nafir, from Ibn Umar. This Isnad was called the golden chain. So Abdul Hay, he used to say, he lived about 100 years ago. He used to say, for me to um, link myself with the scholarship of India in terms of hadith, is more beloved to me. It's almost like Imam Malik in his time linking himself to these great chains. So this is a great uh, honor. Many of the great books, the best book, one of the best books or one of the most widely read books on Sira is what? Ar-Rahiq al-Mahtoum. And who is it written by? Sheikh Safiur Rahman Mubarak Puri from India who passed away recently. So in some of the best commentaries on hadith, like in, in Tirmidhi, the best commentary on hadith written by an Indian scholar and so on and so forth. So you cannot afford to ignore um, the history of these various regions. We have to learn from each other. And learning from uh, different cultures enhances our own learning, enhances our own perspective. So we're going to look at uh, a brief history of, of India. Now this is a map of India. You can see how it's a massive place. It's a place that's kind of, if you look at it from this perspective, it's kind of in the center between China and the Middle East and Africa. So it's kind of like a crossroads. Um, and therefore, it was a very important stopping point for various civilizations. This is an overview 
of the history of India. I don't want to give you a history lesson. History is, can be very technical and boring, um, but just to give you a brief uh, summary and an overview is very, very important. Um, I like to begin with uh, begin the history of the subcontinent um, with various perspectives. So I want to begin with this particular phase called uh, Yom Aqaba. So how many people heard of this? Anyone know what I what this means? What's Yom Aqaba? It's a special day. Okay. Um, so don't worry about the slides. The slides were not important. They don't have a lot of information, just the name. So just listen to me for... Uh, so Yom Aqaba. Anyone know what that is? It's a, it's a day. What kind of day or what particular day? Um, it's something you should all know. Do you know? Yes? No. Okay. Any of the adults know Yom Aqaba? Okay, so what was the day? So tell me the... So it's, it's coming from the Prophet وسلم, in that time? So what, what particular day was that? Huh? Okay, no, so this is, so this, either you know it or you don't. Um, so this is, this is a, it goes back to a very moving, moving um, narration. Um, the nephew of Aisha radiallahu anha, he narrates from her, she told him a story. So Aisha told Urwa ibn Zubair a story. She said, one day, I asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam something. And she said to him, Hal ata alayka yawmun, ashadda alayka min yawm uhud. And this hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari, Kitab Bad al-Khalq. Hadith from Sahih al-Bukhari. Aisha, she asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, have you ever experienced a day more difficult than the day of Uhud. Any day of Kanyu more difficult than the day of Uhud. Uhud was a difficult time. That's where the Prophet was wounded. People thought he died. He lost his uncle. He lost so many of the companions, 70 of the best companions. So this is probably the biggest defeat of the Muslims in the Prophet's lifetime. So it was a devastating day. So she asked him, Halata alayka yawmun ashadda alayka min yawm Uhud. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he answered. He said, Ya Aisha, لَقَدْ لَقِيتُ مِن, مِن, مِن قَوْمِكَ مَا لَقِيتُ وَأَشَّدُ مَا لَقِيتُ مِنْهُمْ يَوْمَ عَقَبَ He said, I suffered so much, O oh, Aisha, I suffered so much from your people. But the worst I ever suffered from them was Yom Aqaba, the day of Aqaba. And she was surprised, just like all of you. She didn't know what the Yom Aqaba was. She said, what is this day? What happened on this time? So the Prophet ﷺ, he shared his story. He said, this is the time, it was the year of sorrow when he had lost everyone and everything. And he was rejected by Mecca. He went to the city of Ta'if. City of Ta'if. This picture is a picture I took of the city of Ta'if. This is what the city looks like. It's a mountainous city. So the Prophet ﷺ, he went on a da'wah trip because everyone had rejected him. His uncle Abu Talib had died. There was no protection. His beloved wife Khadija was gone. So he had nowhere to turn. The world had rejected him. There was a handful of Muslims following him. So he traveled to, he decided to try his luck in a new place. He went to the city of Ta'if, city of Ta'if, and he walked, by the way. He went with the servant Zayd. It's about 66 miles uh, away from Mecca. And if you, you can't Google it. Um, I couldn't find directions from Google, but if you look in the maps, it takes about 26 hours of walking if you don't stop. So you can imagine how many, how much uh, sacrifice and struggle and hardship uh, he endured. And if you visit Ta'if today, most people don't visit Ta'if when they go to Mecca and Medina. It's not part of the approved cities that you can go to with your visa. But if you ever go there, you have to go by car. It's such a difficult drive because it's so high up and it's so mountainous, so just going there in your car makes you exhausted. Imagine going there on foot. So the Prophet, he said, I went there, and he shared the whole story. The summary of the story is the city rejected him. He went there with so many hopes and aspirations. 
He wanted to give the message of Islam. He wanted to guide people to Allah. And they rejected him. Not only did they reject him, they kicked him out. Not only did they kick him out, they threw stones upon him and you know the story. But the most difficult time, he said, was not that day when they rejected him or when they kicked him out. It was a time when he was unconscious and he woke up and he found the angel Jibreel standing in front of him. And the angel said, look, Ya Muhammad, Allah had enough. Here's the angel of the mountains and waiting for your command. If you command that angel, you know, Allah will bring these two mountains and crush these people who rejected you. Meaning the people of Ta'if primarily and also the people of Bakka who rejected him. So the Prophet Sallallahu he said his golden words. He said no. It was so painful to hear that idea that perhaps these people would be destroyed by the angel. So he said, Bal arju an yukhrij Allahu min aslabihim man ya'budullaha wahda la tushriku la yushriku bihi shay'a. He said no. I still have hope that from the children of these people will be some who worship none but Allah not associate any partners with him. So this is what he said about these people. He said, I have hope that from their children will be those who worship Allah. So look at the, 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 the drive, the himma, the hopes, the mercy of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So how is that linked to our history? So who was the main tribe in Ta'if is Banu Thaqif. Banu Thaqif is the main tribe in the city of Ta'if, the main clan. Anyone who hails from that clan would be known as a Thaqafi. So anyone who's from that area. So the first person to enter India was who? First Muslim to enter in or, uh, as, a, as a warrior, as a conqueror, someone who took over a city. Was, who was the first person? I know many people here would know, people from Pakistan and India. Muhammad bin Qasim al-Thaqafi. Muhammad ibn al-Qasim al-Thaqafi. So he was, he was born in Ta'if. This is 80 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet wasallam. He was born in Ta'if. So Ta'if eventually became Muslim. And there were famous Muslims from Ta'if. But the first one to open up the Indian subcontinent was, and this is, this is a picture from Ta'if. There's a, the, the mountains are dangerous. They're filled with monkeys. Even now, if you drive there, you'll see all these monkeys on the road. So the first person to enter that region was Muhammad ibn al-Qasim al-Thaqafi. He was a cousin of Hajjaj bin Yusuf. And this is during the era of um, al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik, the Umayyad Khalifa. So Muslims entered that region. This is the first time they actually put a stronghold there. But the fact is, Muslims went there before that. Because what was the situation, if you know the story? What happened was, there was a Hindu ruler in that region, in this red region that you can see. So what happened is, this is a region that's a coastal region. So these people, they would be pirates. They were primarily pirates. So trade and business was very, very important for thousands of years. So people from Africa and people from Arabia would go by sea to India to trade. And from there, they would go to China. So this, was, this was an important trade route. So the people, there are certain uh, tribes in this region that became known for piracy. So they would, rule, uh, they would um, loot these caravans and they would kill people, take them hostage. So what happened was a number of, there was one caravan in particular that had a number of Muslims, including Muslim women, that was taken captive. And they were coming from where? They were coming from Sri Lanka, what would be known as Sri Lanka today. And they were Muslim and they were captured one of the female Muslims escaped. Her na name was Nahid. And then she wrote a letter to Hajjaj bin Yusuf uh, explaining the situation. Look, we're in trouble. A um, number of our sisters were taken captive. We need help. So Hajjaj bin Yusuf decided to help. First, he sent a message to the Hindu governor. He was um, um, to release the Muslims. So you can imagine Muslims were there already. That means before Muhammad ibn al-Qasim, that means they were there very early on, in the time of the Sahaba. In fact, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he sent a delegation there. And there was a city called Makran where they, they had a battle and they won. But Umar ibn al-Khattab, he ordered them to come back. Don't stay there. So Umar ibn al-Khattab, his, his 
focus was elsewhere in the east, in, in, in Qadisiyah, in, in Jerusalem. So he brought them back. So the Muslims didn't establish a permanent presence. But then Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anh, there are reports that he sent a delegation to scout out this area, to bring back information, what's going on in this region. And they went as far as Bombay, and they went as far as Delhi. But we don't know many details about this delegation, but they came back, and Uthman, for some reason, decided not to pursue that further. So there were Muslims going there much earlier. And there were already Muslims when Muhammad ibn al-Qasim came. And he came essentially to rescue some Muslim women. So when the, the Hindu governor did not respond, so Hajjad bin Yusuf, he sent Muhammad ibn al-Qasim, his cousin. He was 17 years old, at the head of an army. And he went into this region called Sindh. This region is called Sindh today. Parts of it are in Iran, but primarily it's in Pakistan today. So he went there, they had a battle, and he was very, um, you know, they defeated their enemies. They freed those captives. And then they established themselves, they, um, they opened the city of Multan, and they went as far north as in, 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 in mid-Pakistan today. And from that time, this is the year 92 of the Hijri calendar. So this is, you can see India and the rest of the, this is prior to Islam, this is what the world looked like. So 92 of the Muslim calendar, 711 Hijri, was when the Muslims established themselves in the city of Multan in the province of Sindh. So this is, this is a time when there are companions still alive in the world. And by the way, this is the same year that Tariq bin Ziyad entered Gibraltar and entered into Andalus. So the same time Muslims were establishing presence in that region. So this is the earliest presence of Muslims, um, Muhammad ibn al-Qasim al-Thaqafi rahimahullah ta'ala. After him, the Muslims stayed in those regions, but they didn't go further uh, north or further east uh, until the time of, and I'm skipping over vast portions of history, I'm just giving you the basics of some of the important figures. There was a great uh, ruler by the name Mahmud from Ghazna, Mahmud al-Ghaznawi. So he was born in 361 Hijri or 971, and he was born in Afghanistan. And by this time in the north, north of India, the regions of Central Asia were predominantly Muslim. Either they were Persian or Turkish. So he was born um, to a, his father's name was Sabuk Tikin. He was a Turkish general in the army of the Samanid dynasty, which were Persians. So eventually his father, the Persians became very weak at that time, the Samanids. And then his father, he established himself. And then his son took over his father's reign and he established himself as an independent commander. So he break, broke away from the Samanids. And so his, 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 his father was Turkish, his mother was Persian. So he basically allied himself with the Abbasids. They were the Khalifas at that time. So what he did was then he started looking towards the east and towards the south. So he started traveling into India. He made a number of raids into India. He went 17 times into the heart of India. And he raided India. He established uh, presence in different cities and he conquered different cities. And he was someone who was very close to the scholars. Mahmoud Ghaznawi, one scholar, so the Samanids had a number of scholars, so one of them became a prisoner when they were conquered. His name was Al-Bayruni. He was a very, very famous scientist and scholar. So when Mahmoud Al-Ghaznawi found out he's in prison, he said he found out what his, his scholarship was, he freed him and he employed him. And he began to travel with Mahmoud. In one of these journeys, Al-Bayruni traveled to India with Mahmoud, and he liked the region, he settled there, and he stayed in India. So he was a Persian scholar, he was, wrote so much in various fields, and he was a brilliant scholar who knew six languages. When he arrived in India, he learned Sanskrit, and he became fluent in it. He translated some Sanskrit works. He translated some Greek works into Arabic and also in that language. And he wrote a book, Kitab al-Hind, which is one of the best books on the history of India, written by a non-Indian. And it was translated into multiple languages, still people read it uh, today. Al-Bayruni was known as the father of anthropology, a brilliant scholar who basically settled uh, in that region. Um, he made so many advanced, uh, you know, he, in his writings you find so many advanced things. In his writings you find that he's in, the, in parts of India he found uh, fossils of marine life. And he concluded there must have been a river basin here, there must have been a big sea here. In his book on astronomy, which he wrote for the son of Mahmoud, uh, called Kitab al-Mas'udi, 
he shares the locations of 1,000 stars, and they're so accurate even today if you look at their longitude and latitude. He's the one who calculated the circumference of the Earth, the radius of the Earth, and it's accurate to within 15 kilometers of, of what it is today, known today. So this is, you know, scholars, they traveled with, with these great uh, Muslim uh, leaders. So Mahmoud al Ghaznawi went deep into India. Uh, the poet Firdausi was the one who wrote so many poems. There's a famous poem of 60,000 lines. The, it's called the, it's the Shanamat of, uh, of Firdausi. It was written for Mahmoud. So Mahmoud was, had so many scholars in his court. There's so many things we can say about him. But he's the first one who kind of went into India to the heartland. Not on the outskirts, but also deep into the heartland. After him, basically, the Ghaznawis um, ruled over India. This is, the red is their um, domain. So the, the, the yellow is the other parts of the Muslim world. So he kind of established himself. And after him, as always is the case, you have one generation that's very strong. And the second generation becomes lazy. And it's the same history everywhere. Ibn Khaldun talked about that. First generation, they have to struggle. They have to survive. They establish themselves. They do great things. And then the second or third generation, they lose those great things because now they become privileged and entitled. And so Mahmoud, after he was gone, uh, his empire kind of collapsed. It just lasted a couple of years. And then after him, the next great phase in Indian history is the Delhi Sultanate. And so this was started by Qutb al-Din Aybak. So he was another Turkish general. So he was basically one of the slaves of, you know, of the previous dynasty. He became independent and he established himself. He established for the first time an independent government in the heartland, so in the, in the region of Delhi. And this became known as the Delhi Sultanate and it lasted for hundreds of years. There was a series of dynasties that were a part of that. So Qutb al-Din Aybak, his contribution is he's the first one to build all the monuments, the Islamic monuments in India. Up until that time, there weren't any great masajid or monuments built there. He's the one who built, uh, this is called the uh, Qutb Minar. It's a great, um, it was probably the tallest building in the world at that time. Even today, it's one of the tallest brick structures in the world. It was an important um, milestone on the Silk Road. People would pass through the Silk Road and they would look for this monument. So. Um, Qutb al-Din Aybak, he was someone who built many, many great uh, Islamic uh, structures and masajid throughout India. And after him, a number of dynasties took over. There was the Khalji dynasty uh, by Alauddin Khalji, who was the first one. So I mentioned in the beginning, India was always pockets and decentralized. There were only three rulers in our history that united the entire, or ruled over the entire subcontinent. And one of them was Alauddin Khalji. And then after him, Muhammad ibn Tughluq. And after him, um, Indi uh, Timur -e Lang was like a Turkish Mongol invader who came in and destroyed and ended the Delhi Sultanate. So there was always politics going on. There were empires rising, empires falling. So without going into details, this is not a history lesson, but just to give you an idea what was happening in India. So the Delhi Sultanate was probably the first time you had like an, uh, an administration and government in India that lasted into modern times. And then after them, the final and great empire in India were the Mughals, right? The Mughals, the Mughal Empire. So how did they come into being? So the Mughal Empire, so the Delhi Sultanate after Muhammad ibn Tughluq, um, after Timur -e Lang destroyed them, uh, and he left, by the way, he didn't stay in India. So then there was infighting. There were a number of different dynasties fighting each other. They were very weak. Um, and there was so much infighting that one of them invited a general from the north to come and help him. So when, when you have a power vacuum and people are weak, then people of power from other places, they come and fill the power vacuum. So he invited someone by the name of Babur, Babur Shah. And now we're in the 1500s by now. So Babur Shah was a fifth generation descendant of Timur -e Lang from his father's side. And from his mother's side, he was a descendant of Genghis Khan. So he had this uh, incredible genealogy. He was a powerful general, very brutal and very powerful. So he came in and he basically, um, and he spoke Chugtai Turkish was his native tongue and Persian was his scholarly tongue. So he's the first one who came and he conquered the Delhi Sultanate on behalf of one of the uh, people and then he stayed and he established himself in India. And after him, his son Humayun, then his son Akbar, 
and then his son Jahangir and all the great Mughal emperors. So these are the people who built modern India, all the great roads, all the great structures. They built things like the Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal was built by Shah Jahan. He was the third uh, Mughal emperor in the 1600s. So they built these incredible structures that are still there today and they kind of united parts of India. Um, one of the rulers was Akbar, he was number four. And Akbar was someone who also contributed to India but he was very controversial. He was someone who tried to come up with a new religion. He tried to mend uh, or meld uh, Hinduism with Islam and he came up with new things. He came up with new laws. One of the things he did was he forced Muslim men to wear silk to Jumar, and he forced Muslim men to wear gold. Um, he chained Assalamu Alaikum to something else, to a different form of greeting. And there were many Muslims that fought his, um, you know, his, his changes. It was, during his lifetime he was successful. After he died, most of these changes were reversed. So there were many great scholars that stood up and they wrote against him and they gave education and they gave da'wah to try to reverse some of these changes um, that Akbar tried to do. After him there was Jahangir, and then Shah Jahan, and then finally the last Mughal emperor I just want to mention before going on is Aurangzeb. So Aurangzeb was probably the greatest of the Mughal rulers, at least from a Muslim perspective. He ruled for the longest, he ruled almost 50 years. He was the most powerful, and he was also the most pious. He built many masajids, and he also, um, he contributed to Islamic scholarship. Many great scholars came to that region in his time. He was one of the first people in Muslim history to compile the Sharia in written form, the entire code of Sharia. So it was called Fatawai Alam Giriya. It was a great project. He called the greatest scholars of, of that region to come together and put all their fatawa in an official document and compile this massive volume. And it's still available today. You can consult it. Um, so he was a great scholar, uh, a great, great ruler, very pious. He wrote the entire Quran with his hand a number of times. And he was known for engaging in jihad during the day and praying to Hajj that night. So he's someone today, they're trying to erase his history um, for obvious reasons in, in India. They're trying to uh, rewrite his history, portray him as a different ruler. Um, so all these politics aside, we should study history as objectively as we can. Uh, he had many great contributions. Um, all rulers have faults as well. So Aurangzeb is very, very important in the Muslim history. And after him, basically, in his time, the, now the, the, the European power is beginning to come into the Muslim world. So in his lifetime, probably the British East India Tea Company started coming into India, and the Muslims were unaware. And after he was gone, there was a series of weak Mughal rulers, um, and they really were very uh, disunited. Some of them, their empire crumbled to just to various cities. And the last Mughal emperor was Bahadur Shah Zafar. So he was someone in the 1800s. Um, up until 18, 1857 is an important year in India. Who knows what that year is? 1857. Yes, the Sepoy Mutiny. So this was, so now the, the British East India Company had come into India and they started, uh, they came originally as a business on the shores and then they started taking over land, enslaving people and, um, so eventually there was a reaction from, from, from Indians. So this was a great rebellion in 1857 where, you know, Bahadur Shah Zafar was involved, many Muslims were involved, great scholars were involved, and many Hindus were also involved. They kind of came up with a united front against the colonialists, but they failed. So the mutiny was a failure. And then after the 1857, the British basically took over all of India. And the British Raj became, so they, what they did is they um, tried the last Mughal Emperor, Bahadur Shah Zafar, for treason, found him guilty. They exiled him to Burma, where he died, and they killed many of his family members. And, um, and basically, the Mughal Empire ended that year, 1857. So this was the year Muslim rule of almost 1,000 years ended in India. And the British took over for a number of years until modern times, 1947, and so on and so forth. So this is a brief history of, of, of the Muslim presence in India is very complicated. Uh, there's ups and downs, but it's just something to be aware of because many of these things that happen, many of the developments, many of the changes, many of the books that were written still impact us today. 
So that's why understanding history is very, very important to give an understanding of what's going on today and understanding works today. Um, I'll end by talking a little bit about and making it more relevant to the Muslim community. Um, there's a lot of talk about Islamic scholarship in India. So, you know, what was Islamic scholarship like and these seminaries that we have, the Alim courses around the world, where do they come from? Just to give you a little bit of background, um, this is a book, by the way, um, that I translated of my sheikh, an Indian scholar, Muhammad Akram Nadwi, uh, Lessons Learned, Treasures from Nadwa Sages. It's available on Amazon. I also have some copies, which if anyone's interested to learn more about the history in India. This is talking more about uh, what an Islamic studies curriculum was looked like in India, what traditional Muslim education in India was like, and talks about some of the great institutions of learning in India, uh, where they came from, some of the history. So it's, it's an interesting book if you're interested. Um, but basically, in India, the, the greatest scholar, the, without a doubt, the greatest Muslim scholar in India was Shah Waliullah, Ad-Dahlawi, rahimahullah ta'ala. He lived in the 1700s. So he was a great scholar. His father ran a school in Delhi called the Madrasa Rahimiya. So Shah Waliullah was a brilliant scholar. He studied uh, under his father. He became a teacher in the seminary. Then he made Hajj. In Hajj, he discovered Hadith. And he discovered in Hajj at that time, there was a revival of Hadith learning. So there were many great uh, circles of Hadith. People from around the world were coming and learning Hadith and bringing it back to their towns and their regions. So Shah Walilai discovered uh, the works of Hadith. I mean, he knew about them, but he never really studied them. The Muwatta, Imam al-Bukhari's work, he discovered the works of Ibn Taymiyyah, and he brought them back to India. And he came back to India, he redid his curriculum, he started teaching Hadith like never before. And he started teaching in his father's seminary, Madrasa al-Rahimiya. So this was the, one of the major seminaries of learning in India. And all the great seminaries today, or the great scholars today in India that come from different schools and movements, most of them, or almost all of them, trace their intellectual genealogy back to Shah Waliullah, Waliullah Dahlawi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. So from there you had another school called Farangi Mahal. Um, this was built in the, in the 1700s. But then the modern school, there are three major schools, and I'll end with that, the three major schools in India that are very, very important to know. One is Darul Ulum Dioban. You hear the term Diobandi, it means someone who studied at this particular seminary. So this was established um, after the British uh, or the, the 1857 mutiny, the Indian Rebellion. So just a couple of years later, 1866, this seminary was established. So basically it was established with a vision in mind. So there were a number of scholars, they felt they had to preserve the Muslim heritage. Um, because now the British had fully taken over. They were dismantling Muslim educational institutions. So they created this Darul Ulum in order to preserve uh, their curriculum and their heritage. That was established by Shah Wadiullah and his colleagues about a uh, hundred years earlier. And then the second major, so this was so successful that so many schools around India or the subcontinent modeled themselves after their curriculum. Their curriculum was known as Darse Nizami. And all these schools that popped up around the subcontinent affiliated themselves um, with this institution and they started teaching their own version of the curriculum. The second major school, so these are different trends. This, so Darul Ulum Deoban wanted to preserve the Muslim heritage and they did a great job. The second school went in the opposite direction. So Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan was a modernist Muslim. He was very pious, but he was also a modernist. He felt for Muslims in the new world, we had to change and we had to adapt our heritage to the exigencies of the new world. So he established uh, the Muhammadan Anglo-Oriental College in Aligarh. And it was an important college. Many great individuals, some great historians, even European historians, they taught there and studied there. Uh, so he established the seminary. Eventually it became Aligarh Muslim College. And this is where Allama Iqbal came and studied and he uh, taught here as well. So this was another model of learning in India that impacted many great leaders. Many of the politicians came from this particular school. So their approach was more modernist. Their approach was to take some of Muslim tradition, but to learn secular sciences and adapt some of their ideas for the modern world. 
So this is the second institution. It's still um, there today. And the third institution was like kind of like a bridge. And this was an institution called Nadwatul Ulama, established in Lucknow, in India. So the great figures established uh, or involved in that was a great scholar by the name Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. So this institution wanted the best of both approaches. So they wanted to take, you know, learn all the heritage of Islam. They wanted to focus on Arabic, uh, use Arabic as a base. And they also wanted to teach modern sciences. So it was a very healthy approach, and it's still there today. Anyone who graduates from this institution, they get the title Nadwi. You have a scholar, and yet at the end of the name you have Nadwi. It means he came from this particular institution. So these are three great models of learning in India um, that impact Muslims today. You have the Aligarh model, you have Deoband, and you have the Nadwi model. Um, and then there are others. There's so many others. There's the Madrasatul Islah, founded by Mawlana Farahi, who was a great scholar of Quran and many smaller institutions, but if you just remember these three, it's a, it's, it's a good um, introduction to um, Muslim scholarship in India. So there's so much that can be said. I think, um, you know, I don't want to bore you guys. Uh, we can talk about individual scholars as well, but maybe we can open up the floor now for comments and questions instead of going further, inshallah. So if, I, I don't know what your normal approach here today, but I don't mind asking questions openly. Raise your hand and I'll call upon you so we can make this organized. Any of the sisters have questions also, you can come to the side here. There's a portion that doesn't have the barriers. You can ask. Um, brother in the back. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, gentlemen. Yes. Yeah. Maybe you. Yeah. Well, after that. Okay, so Bismillah. Um, it's a good question. The question is about the faiths in the subcontinent, the religions. So what were the other religions and um, when Muslims came, were they eclipsed? So um, the fact is that, um, so first of all, whenever any culture or any civilization comes and um, influences another or, or conquers another, this was the way the world worked, there's always a give and take. You have to understand it's never... Um, one culture comes and destroys the other and takes over. There's always, they absorb elements of the local cultures. And that's why you see Muslims all around the world with different colors. Um, the way Muslim women dress, the way they wear their hijab in Arabia is different from Africa, from India, from Turkey, from different regions. So um, first of all, it's a very natural process. You have to realize that everywhere uh, people go, not just Muslims, any people go anywhere. You, you pick up some things and you give some things. There's always a give and take. Regarding the religions of India, so it, this is kind of interesting. Well, the Muslims have been in India for a thousand years, um, but they were always a minority. So that means they never really, uh, they never really gave da'wah, number one, from our perspective. They didn't, uh, there wasn't a large scale effort to convert people through education or through force. So there were always, the majority of the subcontinent, the masses were always Hindu and Buddhist um, to this day. So when the, when the last Bahadur Shah Zafar, this was 1857, the end of the, the uh, Muslim rule. So the Muslims were the first ones to unite the subcontinent and rule over it politically, but they always remained a minority. Not a small minority, there are parts that were predominantly Muslim, parts that were 
So if you want to understand the numbers, just look at what happened when the British took over India. So the, in, the Hindus were dominant, they were majority, and then there were a big section of Muslims in different parts, and there were Buddhists. So, so that's one thing to know that Muslims, wherever they went, it was just, uh, it wasn't really, um, they didn't destroy the local cultures, they didn't get rid of everyone, and, the, and you know, it's, it's as clear as the light of day. That's why India today is majority Hindu, because we ruled for a thousand years and we didn't force everyone to convert. So that's something important to know. A lot of people did convert. There were periods of time where some Muslim rulers, all the Muslim rulers don't do things in the name of Islam. That's one thing to know. This is history. So don't look at history as, you know, everyone's perfect and everyone's doing what they're supposed to do. Many rulers were evil. Many rulers had dark moments and they had good things. Just like today. Which politician in the world you can say is perfect or purely evil or purely good? Anyway, uh, so Muslims kind of everywhere they went around the world, um, there generally weren't mass conversions. They didn't force people to convert. And there's a narrative out there that Muslims went with the sword and they converted everyone. And it's silly when it comes to India because Hindus were always there. They remained there. Their uh, temples of worship were always there. Their temples of worship uh, in India that have cert certificates from Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb is the emperor that is known as uh, was well, the most pious Muslim because he was overtly Muslim. He's a target of this <clears throat> changed narrative. People hate him. So they're changing all the roles that have the name Aurangzeb now in India to something else. So he's being painted as a Muslim fanatic who forced everyone to convert, which is not the case. There's a great book, if you want to know. Um, oh, I have it here. It's a, a recent book written on Aurangzeb by Audrey Trushke. She's a professor in Rutgers University. She's not Muslim. She wrote a fascinating history of Aurangzeb looking at the narrative that people placed as the Muslim fanatical warrior who came and converted everyone. Um, so it's um, uh, important to note these things. Regarding Hinduism and Buddhism, it's very difficult, and I mean this with all, res uh, all, all respect. Um, if you want to understand Hinduism, it's very, very difficult. Um, I've tried uh, most of my life. Um, just give you an interesting, um, when I was in medical school, um, there was a Hindu club in, in the college, and they organized a dinner. And, you know, when you're in college, you don't have money and stuff, so you go to these places to eat. Um, and you have friends also, so we went there. Um, so they had a, invited a guest um, to give a lecture on Hinduism. We all wanted to know, and a lot of my Muslim friends, we went there. So the, the, this is New York. It was in Brooklyn. So because of traffic, the, 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 the guests never came. So, you know, people are getting anxious, so they, the different members of the Hindu club came and they started talking. So each person came and gave his perspective on what his religion is. And every single person said very different things than the previous one. One of the people, the first person who came, he said, basically, Hinduism, we believe in one God, one major God, and then there's sub-gods and things like that. And then another person came and he said something very different. Um, then that professor came, and finally when he came, um, I don't remember a lot of what he was talking about. I do remember he said in, in the same lecture, he said there's no God. He said there's a million gods. He said there are many gods. There's one God. So um, I think to look at it as monolithic faith is very, very difficult. So I think some religions in the world, like we have Islam, is we have a set of beliefs. Wherever we go, this, these are our beliefs, and we have our ethnic culture. But other religions don't have that perspective of religion. Their, their cultures, their ways of looking at the world, there might be ethnic groups like the Jewish faith. The Jewish faith is like basically it's, uh, it's, it's an ethnic thing. It's not really a religion in the way that you can think of as nobody can convert into it. And when you look at their beliefs, sometimes uh, it doesn't fit the same uh, model or way of thinking about religion that we do. So Hinduism, Buddhism is, is a very different way of looking at the world. They have, uh, and it's very, it's not, there are many types and strands of Hinduism and Buddhism. Some of them believe in reincarnation, that the soul reincarnates in a different light form. Some of them don't. Some of them have, being probably influenced by Muslims, have more or less monotheistic visions, but like the, the, the other gods are not really gods, or they have powers delegated to them from the, the one god, and so on and so forth. So I'm not the expert for that. Um, I can't tell you um, what that faith is or those faiths are.
but just know it's very diverse and you should consult someone from there. But it's a good point to note that Muslims went there and they remained minority. Um, although they were the rulers for a thousand years, but they were generally tolerant in that region. Uh, plus or minus various episodes in history. Wallahu a'lam. Anyone else? Yeah, you had a question, brother? Yes. Do you have a, uh, if you have a reference, I don't think so. If you have a reference, just send it to me, um, I'll look it up. There's the problem in history, especially history in, uh, in India, there are a lot of things that are um, not very reliable. For instance, in India, there's a funny story or interesting story of there's, or Indian Muslims like to claim that there's, there's a Sahabi who's Indian. Right, and his name was Baba Ratan Al Hindi. Baba Ratan Al Hindi. So he lived in the 600, 600 years after the Prophet. So they claim that he was 700 years old. In his childhood, he went to uh, Mecca and he met the Prophet as a child, and the Prophet made dua for him uh, as a child. This is before Nabuwa. And then he came back and, and he used to teach in his lifetime that, you know, I met the Prophet. And people would narrate from him things, and so even today, people narrate his story. So, and and there's there's a long series of hadith that he narrates and stuff. Um, so, Imam al Dhahabi, Imam Dhahabi was a great historian. Uh, he wrote about him. He said this is one of the greatest liars in the world. Uh, he made this whole fancy uh, tales and lies, and he said Imam Dhahabi said in his seer, he said, anyone who believes these things then we have no medicine for such a person. That person himself needs help. So things like that, there's so many stories that this person being 700 years old, this person like he made a hole through the mountain and or this person met the Prophet So Allahu Alam, we need to verify sources, look at history books and see what's uh, verifiable. As far as we know, during the Prophet's time, there's no interaction between anyone from that region, but it could be, there's a possibility, but what's documented, I, I would have to say Allahu Alam. If you have, if you find a reference, if you can forward to me, we can look it up, inshallah. Yes, brother. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, so um, what I mentioned is Sri Lanka is more towards the south. And it was just Sri Lanka. So South India, if you look at the map, um, South India, because of its connection to Africa and its connection to the rest of the world, uh, always interacted with the rest of the world, even before Islam. So there were Arabs uh, before Islam that were coming to South India in the Kerala region and other regions that re um, and establishing and getting trade, getting goods from there and trading back and forth. Um, so most likely the earliest Muslims were in that region because of these trade routes. So before Muhammad ibn Qasim went to Sindh, um, definitely there were Muslims there. And then, you know, and I mentioned that the reason he responded, the excuse he got as a reason to go there, because some people asked him for help from the south. So probably there's, this is a, it's a fascinating research topic. I don't think, we, we don't have good historians that study this region. I'm sure if you travel in that region and you look at archaeological remains, look at the masajid, research history, we will find instances of Muslims that interacted with maybe Sahaba, maybe early Muslims from that region much earlier, and maybe established a masjid or maybe established something here and there. So for sure, probably the earliest Muslims is a good point. Before Muhammad ibn al-Qasim was probably in the south region, through the sea. Right? In the land, you have to go through cities and you have to conquer. But through the sea, you can come as a trader. So uh, Muslims were coming to trade, and they probably they shared their faith in peaceful ways through that. So this is this is something I really would love to study and visit that region. That region is very different from North India. North India, um, you know, it's it's 
predominantly Hanafi. In Kerala, you find many people are Shafari, so Indians who are Shafari, or who might be other uh, schools of thought that are not Hanafi. So not everyone in India, including Muslims, fits the same profile. So Kerala, because it had an independent channel of, of communication with the rest of the world, has a slightly different history. Um, and not only Kerala, Kerala is just one example of a city, but there, it's a huge subcontinent. Um, Wallahu alam. Thanks for bringing that up. Anyone else? Yes, brother in the back. No, they came as Muslims. So uh, Babur was Muslim. He was Chagatai, but they were already Muslim when they came to India. So um, they were already Muslim. Uh, so Babur was um, was a Chagatai Turk, and at that time there were the Ottomans, and the Ottomans were very early, and then there were the Safavids. So Babur was kind of allied himself with the Safavi Empire against the Ottomans for some reason, and um, he spoke Persian. Uh, and he was Muslim, so he came into India. Then his son, Humayun, he, um, so the father was great, uh, in terms of, uh, at least in terms of administration, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, his son kind of lost his empire, Humayun. So Humayun lost the empire, and he lost everything, and he was kicked out, and he went back. He sought refuge with the Safawids, and the Safawids, they made him convert to Shiism in order to rescue him. So he nominally converted to Shiism, he stayed with them, and then he came back to India. And eventually he died in India in Delhi. So they were all Muslim from the, from the beginning when they came to India. Prior to that, Timur Elang, that's the generation they were converting to Islam. So this was like, so Genghis Khan, all goes back to Genghis Khan, the Mongol herds. They were coming in the 1200s to the Muslim world, and eventually generation two and three began converting to Islam. <clears throat> so Barke Khan, was a grandson of Genghis Khan. He was the first great Muslim, first ruler that became Muslim and he kind of repelled the Mongols. And then Timur Ilang was Muslim later and he was Mongolian also and Muslim. So it's kind of complicated history. Uh, hope that answers some of the... Yes. Good question. That's a good question to think about, and you know, a good historian can come up with his ideas about the end. Very good insight. So Malaysia. So go further. So this is the Indian subcontinent. If you go even further east, you have Malaysia and Indonesia. They're almost 100% Muslim. Not 100%, but you almost like 90, above 95%. And there was no big war or conquest there. That was a peaceful transition. So interesting how that is and perhaps uh, there's some lessons that can be drawn there Allahu <laughs> A'lam I plan to go to Malaysia in one month for the first time inshallah I'll start to research some history there yes brother no. I can sign off for You're asking about the impact in India or elsewhere around the world? So Muslims lived in India um, when they became part of the landscape. They became Indian. So uh, maybe Babur was Shukhtai Turkish, but the later Mongols, you can say they're Indian because now they're marrying uh, from local. And by generation six or seven, can you say someone still some, like... Your children here, our children are American. And we still have a little bit of our culture left, but 
fast forward four generations from now. Think about your, your children's grandchildren. What are they going to be? Are they going to still be Egyptian and Pakistani and Moroccan? They're going to marry different people from different cultures and they'll live here. So they're going to be something else. So Muslims became part of the landscape. They became indigenous. Um, so they had, um, relatively speaking, for the much of the thousand years, it was very, there was a lot of uh, tensions also. They were fighting in between communities. But predominantly, it was peaceful. Uh, so there was, there was respect. Um, it was only when the British came, that's when the first time we saw massive, um, you know, rioting between faiths and religions. I mean, you can argue that that was a British policy to bring one uh, group against the other, and then they're fighting people they grew up with. They were fighting each other. People went to the same school. Sometimes even family members, some of them are Hindu, some of them are Muslim. Now with these new tensions, that, uh, they're fighting each other. So, you know, for a thousand years, it's very different. And the Delhi Sultanate was different. The Mughal Empire was different. Each ruler was different. Some periods, it was very scholarly. A lot of people came to study, and Hindus were studying in Muslim uh, institutions. And even others came and studied there and vice versa. And sometimes it was a little tense, just like anywhere in the world. Um, but overall, I think uh, there's a lot of hard lessons we can draw from, from, from the Muslim presence in India, like why in Morocco and other parts of the world we have a stronger presence and our culture and in terms of the, the uh, people becoming Muslim on their, on, their, on their free choice was much greater in other parts of the world than in India. Allahu alam, these are hard questions. It's even harder to discuss it when today there's so much tension between India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, these three countries. There's so much tense history there and um, it's hard to do anything, hard to talk to, and everyone has their own vision of things. It's like a radioactive. Even last year I tried to go to India, I was denied because I was born in Pakistan. I'd love to go there and, 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 and if, if you're as a Moroccan, you can go to India anytime. As an Egyptian, you can go to India the next day, um, get a visa. But if you have any link to Pakistan, like if you're born in Pakistan, or even if you're not born in Pakistan, your parents are born in Pakistan, or your grandparents, um, then you know either you get denied or you have to go through a special process, which is very difficult. And the same thing with Pakistan. India to Pakistan goes both ways. So it's, it's very hard to like come through an understanding when things are that tense. It's like the Israel-Palestine conflict, so tense and so many things written on both sides. Uh, real historians need to like let the dust settle and try to come up with a good understanding guided by Muslim principles, inshallah. Allahu alam. Yeah. Oh, any, it's hard to know if the sisters have questions, but um, any sister has question, I said uh, they can come to the side. Um, or you can, if you feel more comfortable writing it down, sending it forward, inshallah. You're talking about today? Well, I mean, like anywhere else, um, you have to look at the average people have a different way of looking at things. So average people don't have problems with each other. So in all these villages in India, up until even all my, most of my teachers are Indian. They say up until recent times, um, there was no problem in their neighborhoods. People knew each other. They respected each other. Hindus and Muslims lived together. They lived together for a thousand years. Um, and generally speaking for the majority of people it's 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 natural just like anywhere like neighborhoods here you have neighbors of different faiths you don't care about what their faith is but you find a way to live together but when politics happen and and certain uh, things happen then there are certain groups that stoke these uh feelings and and they purposely do this right now there's a government in india that's staunchly racist and anti-muslim and it's rewriting history and it's provoking these tensions. 
So now it's being provoked. So the last uh, five to 10 years is really bad. So there's all these tensions being provoked on uh, in different neighborhoods. There are neighborhoods where now Muslims are being attacked and uh, um, you know, burned alive and things like that. And they were there for you know generations. There was no problem until recent times. So, you know, as Muslims, we have to kind of remind people of you know ethics and what Islam teaches, and to look at people as human beings. And um, currently, it's very, very tense. We just ask Allah to ease the tensions. Uh, my Sheikh uh, Yusuf Islah, he usually comes back and forth. He actually had to cancel his flight for the first time in his 50 years of coming back and forth because of the situation in India. He had to postpone it and then he wound up going eventually. So, Allah al-Musta'an, may Allah ease the suffering of Muslims around the world. Okay, I think, uh, thank you for your listening. I know.